Greetings, everybody. Nick DiVirgilio here in Burbank, California at Ocean Way Audio. We're going to go inside, talk to Alan Sides and Colin Liebick about Alan's amazing speakers. Alan has been building speakers since he was a kid, and he really knows what he's doing. I mean, above and beyond almost anybody else on the planet. So many great recordings have been made on his speakers and in his studios, from the Rolling Stones to Michael Jackson, Natalie Cole, everything in between. It's an amazing process and really cool to hear the technical side of how he builds his speakers and just to hear the great stories because Alan's been in the business a long time. So join me inside and let's get going. Inside of Ocean Way Audio right now, this is Colin Liebick on my right. Sir. Nice to see you, sir. Alan Sides on my left. Now, Alan, there's just a very small sample of all the amazing gold and platinum records that you've been involved with throughout your career. But we're, please tell us some stories about these before we leave today. But we're here to talk about your speakers. Now, you've been building speakers since you were a young man, even before you got into the recording business, right? Absolutely. So, and, and you're still making great speakers today, and that's what we're here to talk about. So what do you want to, what do you want to show us and tell us about today while we're here? Well, I think the premise that's a little bit different about our company than most companies is that because I'm a recording engineer, because I'm a producer, because I design and build studios, my whole thing was when I created a control room with amazing loudspeakers and I brought a client in, the fun for me was to play it for them and then just to go, that's ridiculous. And when they did that, I was happy. And so I look at it from not just a selling point of the studio, but to have something that gives you resolution in a way that mixing is easy. Right. That when you bring up the faders and you balance it, it's gonna, if it sounds great when you play in your car, it's gonna hit every button you want it to hit. And so I've been doing that since the garage. So in certain respects, things, and in my garage, I had pretty, ama pretty large speakers, you know, even then. But I, when I would do a tracking day and the musicians would come up for the playback, and you know, maybe Nathan Eats and all the great players, they come in, their joy was to sit at the console and listen to this. And then that, that's my whole thing. That's it right. still is, hasn't changed really. How old were you when you built your first pair of speakers? 13. And what, got, what made you get inspired to do something like that? I mean, it's funny, you know, the, the toughest thing is, is, is I design and build speakers, but there isn't, there's, there's only a few, a handful of recordings that sound ridiculous. And we all, we always search for those really unique recordings. Right, right. So I said, well, you know, um, I, can, I know what I want as a musician, as a bass player, I know what I want to sound like. So I started doing live gigs, going out recording bands, and because uh, I wanted to get amazing sounding stuff to play on my speakers. And it's sort of like one thing led to the other. So when I built the first studios, the premise there was, I built the studio to make recordings to play on my speakers. <laughs> Not because I intended to be <laughs> you know, anything other than that. Right. But people became so interested in the recordings that basically that became a whole other business. Well, and one of the things we talked about just moments ago was back then, there wasn't a great deal of manufacturers who made speakers that could deliver what Alan wanted. Right. And I do want to start off with the story about how Bill Pudman reacted when he came in. The well, that's funny because Bill Putnam Sr., you know, who owned the United Western Studios and Universal Audio and all that stuff, sure. we became good friends and I invited him down to my garage control room and I played him stuff and I think he was kind of in shock. He said, I didn't know that was possible to get that kind of punch and impact and clarity and low bass. Because, you know, there weren't many speakers that even approached doing that at that period of time. So I think we were a little, you know, a little past what was available and then actually that sort of got Bill into working on the URI Time Alliance system, which became a standard for a good period of time. And I worked with Bill. Even when we did the first demonstration of the URI Time Alliance, we went to the AES show, I think it was in LA, and I found what I felt was the perfect room to demonstrate these. And I have them in the perfect listening position. So when you walked in the door, you were in the sweet spot. And I provided program material that had like sections of just high points, musical high points, because keeping your span of attention is difficult. But if you play one great moment after the next and it doesn't stop, they don't leave. Right. They just kind of stay there glued. And I would do the same thing in the studios. I remember one time when Phil Collins came in for a playback and I, I, I wanted him to be, I wanted, he was thinking of using the studio for a project, and he sat down and I played him little excerpts and says, that's fine, that's gonna work just great. And you know, that's been it. So operating commercial studios and keeping my clients happy has always been part of my package. And it was based on listening. Oh, absolutely. Sure. Yeah. Well, and, and these records, I mean, well, obviously, the it's, it's proof of the pudding, right? You guys, exactly. it worked. Definitely well, yeah, worked. I mean, albums recorded our studios have sold in excess of a billion copies. Yeah. So it was a very, you know, it was good. Yes. So you, you know what you're doing. <laughs> I, I hope so. <laughs> yeah. I hope so. <laughs> I should say so.
All right, so I know that we're in a very important room of the building right here, your listening room. Sure, very important room. We bring clients in to listen. It's, it's quite common, especially with larger setups, sure. that clients want to meet Alan, they want to sit down in a private room and they want to listen. And then Alan kind of, we go through it with him and Alan plays a, I mean, you tell him. Tell him what you play and how we do this. Well, we tried to come up with a space that was, yeah, I didn't want an anechoic chamber. I wanted something that more resembled what a control room might be. Yeah, this is like a comfortable hang room. Yeah, right. Sure. And but had a, a, enough depth to develop a low frequency wavelength that really is fun because, of course, where pop music is gone, low bass is really important. Sure. Subsonic stuff is important. And of course, since our speakers go down almost to the, you know, they go really low, you can actually hear this stuff in clear definition. So this is also a room where. Um, we do a tremendous amount of evaluations, not just of our products, but all the products of the market. Because if we come out with a product, I want to know what everyone is doing. Sure. And if I can't create something that's significantly more interesting or better than that, there's no point for me to do it. I mean, I, and also, from my aesthetic sense, if, if I don't love it, I can't sell it. Sure. I have to really be satisfied on an emotional level, aesthetically and acoustically, that this will do what I want it to well, do. Well, talk about the, through the discussions you and I have had, mm -hmm. If, the, if others out there are doing this, one of the things that made me really excited about Ocean Wave was you said, we gotta be up here. It's, just, it's not just get in there with the others, it's come out of it up here. Right. Remarkably different. Well, you know, you know and I, I don't wanna put anything down, but I mean, most speakers are three circles in a box, right. basically. And so we came up with a premise, and it's really based on my original system, you know, going back to the garage, that I want to be able to play something that's not just good for me in one spot, but I want 10 people standing behind me to hear exactly what I'm hearing. And that didn't exist. There was nothing like that. So if you could create a speaker that could give you 100 degrees of perfect even sound of dispersion, uh, you know, I say 100 by 40, so no matter where you stood, it sounded the same. I can sit here as a mixer, and I can literally have these folks, and I don't have to explain to them that I can't hear the guitar. Well, come right here, sit right here, and now you hear the guitar. Right, right. I said, and I'm thinking those terms. And even our smallest HR5s do that. And there's no other manufacturer that makes anything like that. And so, you know, um, I'm pretty proud of what we created. The bigger thing was, is that we had a huge speakers that sound amazing. That's one thing. But to take that technology and create it in a speaker of this physical size, yeah. that's a piece of work. That's not an easy task. Yeah, and when you look at the first systems, like Alan's gonna talk about, you know, let's definitely mention the HR1s that Michael Jackson used. That technology there comes straight from those larger systems. Sure. So it's boiled down into a little HR5. It's the same thinking, it's the same mentality and know-how and culture. And technology over the years has made that possible though, right? I mean, you've learned how to make smaller things because of just over time, things well, can get smaller and well, it's interesting. do more with that. One of our chief engineers is a gentleman named Cliff Hendricks, he's an MIT physicist and he invented the concentrivity horn. And prior to that, you think in terms of PA systems, it was boxes of stacked stuff, nothing aligned up, Ever we stood, it sounded different. But by taking multiple concentrivity elements, it was able to take what line arrays become to have a whole section of speakers that actually physically align, and when you walk around, it sounds the same. The problem with that is you get great you know, vertical, but not very good horizontal. For what we want in control rooms, we want very wide horizontal. And so, um, Cliff came up with a way to take a system that's this big and make it this big and still create, really, we're not sacrificing anything in a performance standpoint. But originally, when I built this big system for Bruce Whitty and Michael Jackson and Quincy, um, they wanted something that was utterly accurate but nuts. They wanted something that no one had ever seen before. And when we built the big system, the HR1s, each speaker is nine feet high and seven feet wide wow. and basically is flat from 18 hertz to 25 kilohertz. So even though it's big, it's incredibly high fidelity. Sure. And so I think Bruce Wadeen got three consecutive Grammys for Best Engineered Album of the Year on Michael Jackson albums recorded in my studios on my loudspeakers. So it was a moderately successful venture. I would say so. And it kept Bruce and Quincy, you know, basically, they came to work uh, at our studios in Hollywood for parts of Thriller and then basically moved in in perpetuity. <laughs> and so yeah, we had, you know. his room, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, you know, and, and Bruce is incredibly fastidious. It had to be dead on and accurate and fun because, you know, in some respects, we are in show business. And if you as an engineer producer had made something that sounds amazing, wh what more fun is it to play it back for your clients and not only not be a hype, but to have just knock their socks off? Sure. I mean, that's part of the Those joy. Smiles on their faces, yeah. It's music. Oh, it's exactly. supposed to be fun. Yeah. So yeah. coming from a speaker that's nine feet high and seven feet wide, 
to a speaker that basically, you know, is, is slightly less than four feet high and a foot and a half wide, that's quite a deal. But yet this still goes almost as low and as high as the big system and has that same set of dispersion. And then when folks get in the room and they listen to it, that's one of the best points or parts oh, it of it all. Sure. It's just watching the looks on their faces and how they react to it. Well, you made that happen for me when we first yeah. showed up here just a, you know, an hour ago. Well, you played me a few things, and that was just unbelievable sounding. We're just sitting in a chair in front, and it was as clear as day, and you were the volume was pretty cranked, and it was totally pleasant to the ear, and I right. wanted to hear more. Was, well, there's technical me. reasons. Of and, course. And, yeah. and these are the things that really I want you know to explore well, because Alan has created a system here that is not just... A couple of speakers in a box. We're talking right. amplifiers. We're talking DSP. We're yeah, talking more and, and and you know. Well, because I think the other thing is too is that um, if you go to a showroom and the speakers are set up well and you listen and say that's great and I want to put that in my house. Well, if it doesn't sound like that in your house, there's not much fun, is it? Sure. Yeah. So we we figured ways we think that can deliver exactly what you heard in an optimum situation, even if you have situation excuse me where there are some issues acoustically. We have a ways to accommodate and correct flaws in the space, and like we can create. Uh, as what's interesting is that most of the time when we bring a set in of say a three fives, it's usually pretty darn close, and then it's more about just a low frequency and high frequency shelves and half to be degrees at different points that kind of bring it into play for how wide the surfaces are, you know, what the decay times in the room and what the low frequency uh, cancellation is from front to rear. So there are ways to finesse even in a difficult space. Mm -hmm. Well, all this can be adjusted in the DSP. Sure. And that, that really makes Ocean Way unique is that you do have that DSP, you do have those presets that the units come with, and then later can be adjusted if we yeah, need to tweak, fine tune yeah, some yeah. more. Sure. sure, especially for the bigger system. Sure. And then yeah. the and dispersion on the horns, um, that's a, another whole aspect of how the speaker works as far as how hard it has to work. Well, and because you think of a conventional loudspeaker, and it's covering, say, 60 degrees, you know, we're covering 100 degrees, so we can put out the same SPL but over a much wider ratio. The other thing to note is that because we have true conductivity, you've got total dispersion to the edge of the horn flare, but, it, but basically it doesn't go beyond that. It stops. So it's not hitting the sidewalls and coming back and canceling. Because in a conventional speaker with a dome, basically, even though your linear dispersion may only be 60 degrees, it's still putting out sound all the way around, even though it's not uniform. Right. So that sound is hitting the sidewalls and coming back and adding. We can take a room that has, would have acoustical issues and with our speakers not have those issues because we're not getting sidewall reflections. Same thing with the ceiling. Because we're in 40 degrees, it's going up like this, but it's not hitting the ceiling and coming back down to you. It stops there. So there's big advantages in true directivity. Here's the other thing too, is that you think of a conventional loudspeaker, this, this is a very unique horn design because, you know, sometimes horns get a bad name in that they sound like that. Okay, there's ways to completely eliminate it if you understand the physics of it. But there's tremendous value in what a horn can do. And by way of example, you have in this system a high frequency and a mid-bass horn that have identical flare rates. So if you, if you were to measure the response at zero and go 50 degrees off zero, there's no difference. None. And by comparison, there's speakers that use ribbon tweeters. If you stand up, the highs are gone. Right. You know, so it's, it, it's, you, have, you have to put your head right here and hear that. And it's just, it doesn't even, not only does it create a problem for anyone else hearing it but yourself, but also it doesn't hit the walls in the right way because the walls are getting off axis response, which is bad. And that response then comes back to the mix position, generally in or out of phase, depending on the frequency and the wavelength. Well, the amps have a huge amount of headroom. And this creates a much faster re re reaction. It takes, the, yeah, because not, not, only, not only headroom and not only the amount of watts, but also the damping factor, how much control the amplifier has over the, the speakers itself. In the case of the HRP.5, we're using 2,400 watts in the lows, but it's got a damping factor of 2,000. Rarely do you see that you know, sort of thing in any commercial loudspeaker. So therefore, it's a very fast reacting low. Right. But, but one more thing to note also is that in this particular case, you have a high frequency and mid bass with perfectly physical time alignment. And the other thing is, anytime you take a horn and a woofer, say, and the horn, if it has decently, say it has, you know, 90 degrees of dispersion, um, the woofer really only has about 60. So once you get more than 15 to 20 degrees off axis, the sound of the voice, well, the crossover changes completely. But if you cut off the woofer and create a straight horn, it's possible to get 100 degrees on the woofer as well so that no matter where you go, the voice doesn't change. 
And the one other thing that's intriguing is that if you have a dome sitting right here and you're monitoring at, say, 95 dB, it's a pretty good level, right, and say you're six feet away, you get up to 105 to 106, that dome can only go so loud. You're pushing the physics of what it can do. You're at the limit of what that, what that can do. Now, if you create that element and you have a straight horn in front of it, you're now 12 dB more efficient. So now you're at 110 and you're still coasting. So with this high frequency element, with one watt in, I get like 160 dB out of 1K. Wow. So it gives you tremendous resolution and definition. And the one more thing to note, because it's very important about horns is, our physicists who came up with this, almost all horns have a, have a flaw. And the flaw is a thing that's called squint. And what happens is, and it's usually right at a most unpleasant frequency, right in the center of the band. In this particular case, say we're crossing over, it's going from 600 to 20K, it might happen at 3K, right around there, and the, what happens is the squint causes it to the dispersion to narrow and the frequency to rise. And part of that is that sound that we think of as honk. Right. If you understand the physics, it's possible to break the horn angle and totally prevent that from happening so that you have absolutely no horn sound. And the other thing, too, is that all of our horns are made of solid wood and milled on our CNC machine, so there are absolutely no resonances whatsoever. So, how, so I got a question. So how long... Did you have to uh, test this, the, 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 the look, the size, the angle, you know, all the, 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 the material you used to make the horn? How, long, how many years did that take to get to this point? Well, you know, I mean, I'm sure it's a kind of a dumb question because you're always well, testing no, stuff. But, yeah. You think in terms of what it would have taken, you know, 10 years ago, it would have taken years. But with CN machines, the capable actually computer modeling and manufacturing, you know, uh, things, we can make prototypes instantaneously. So we come up with a basic design and we might make 16 or 18 versions of that okay. to test. And we go through and we check every parameter, we listen, we measure, we try every imaginable driver and configuration, and we can come out with a product in a relatively short period of time because that just changes the world and how fast we can do things. Sure. But it still took, I mean, I would say creating the 3.5 was a two-year project. Okay. It well, still it's, took a while. It's important to note too, Cliff was behind the original designs of the Altax. Those horns. Well, when I met him, Cliff was actually, he was the chief engineer at Altec Lansing. He just graduated MIT, and he went to work for Altec in 1973. Okay. And he built custom drivers that I used in my studio in the garage. So that's how far we go back. And when I worked with Bill Hanley doing live sound, we used those same diaphragms and drivers in Fenway <laughs> Park and on concert stages. Sure. So, it was, you know, I kind of also grew up with the horns. I love them. They have a distinct sound. Yes, I mean, and distinct in a good way, not a bad way. Yeah. Of course, of course. Well, Please. and the look of the speaker, you know, I've heard all kinds of comments. What's great about the way they look is it says Ocean Way. You know it's an Ocean Way when you see one. Right. And it's very specific. The math is specific. Well, there's one more thing, too, is that, you know, because I'm a bass player, because I'm a bit of a punch freak, I, to me, you just can't make it big enough and wide enough <laughs> and, cl and clear. Yeah, yeah. I, <laughs> gotta have it. I, I just do that. And, and, and that's I, what's great because, and so don't mean to interrupt you, but that's no, what's no. great because no matter what style of music you're playing oh. through these speakers, it works. Well, exactly. From Dr. Dre to, to, to classical music and everywhere in between, I imagine. Because, you know, we were like, you know, we would do you know, Green Day or Radio Head, right, or 50 Cent, it didn't matter. I had to, and, and one day I say, well, maybe we're doing those acts, the next day we're, we're mixing Avatar. Right. So we need to be completely high fidelity one day and then be able to set up R&B clients well, the next. Right. Think about motion picture soundtracks, what they need to listen to them to really get it right. Sure. You know, it's, it's endless ocean wave systems right. that they were listening to on. The more difficult thing, believe it or not, is the smaller it gets, the more difficult it is. Okay. And so when we came out with HR5, I said, now how can I take it another step? Because I wanted something that was at a reasonable price, that would do, basically, it would still, the premise of what our big speakers is still in the small speaker. Like one thing that's very important to me is that from an imaging standpoint, when I'm mixing, I need everything to be perfectly linear so that if I'm panning or I'm hearing my reverb trails, I need to know it's dead on. So all of our speakers are basically within one dB of each other, plus or minus a half, across the audio band. And that creates perfect symmetry. So when you're listening, it's center, it's just dead center. Panning is just incredibly clear. And, and, and that's, to me, that's just an invaluable tool as a mixer. Sure, sure. And so yeah, the, the 3.5, you know, it, the other thing you're thinking about that everything is a compromise. And it's a fairly small speaker physically. I said you could sit a pair of these on either side of your computer and you could be three feet away from them and wear them like headphones. But because the crossover is so linear, even if you're standing here, you can't hear the horn or the woofer sounding. It just sounds like one linear sound. 
just perfectly linear and perfectly smooth. And that's the premise, is that if you walk up to a speaker and you hear the tweeter and the mid-range se as separate elements, there's something wrong. Right. You shouldn't even, you should, the transition should be so smooth you don't even know it's happening. The HR5s have a remarkable kick. You know, when I first heard them, I just went, wow, that from that little tiny speaker. So well, yeah, and, and yet, the, once again, they'll still, people behind you will still hear the big wide yep. spectrum and sure. all that. All right. Well, fellas, I mean, so much great information. We could sit here all day long and talk about this stuff. This is awesome stuff. But we're going to check out another room of your building. Sure. And uh, let's go Let's go over there and see what you got. Cool. All right, all right thanks. Go. All right, guys, we're in uh, the back room behind your listening room. You know, and I was just saying, I've done a bunch of factory tours of all kinds of different sure. things for Sweetwater. And these kinds of places, it's not a glamorous place. This is where the magic happens, though. A lot of stuff stored. You see all your things around. So what happens here? You got a room here where I'm well, sure you do a lot of wiring things. So what's going on That's really here? important because we make Oceanway speakers here. Right. And There's in another people putting facility. This stuff together, yeah. And they're all hand tacked. They're all hand wired. It's all point to point. It's all hand QC'd. You know, it's not coming in in crates from somewhere else off yonder. Right. It's being done here. And, you know, think about all the custom stuff we do. And Alan can walk you through that just at our facility. We mill, you know, so many very specific systems that are specific because the physics have to have a, and so we create stuff from scratch that works in very difficult environments sometimes. You mean some of these goodies that are all behind us? All kinds of things. Because <laughs> thing is, I mean, everything is, we have a, a plant in Riverside that manufactures all of our woodwork, does all mm -hmm. of our painting, and has our CNC machines, and then we ship from there to here. Everything is assembled here. Right. And uh, basically, they're made in Burbank. It's amazing. You know, they're actually made here. So it's a, uh, but also the other thing that I think is most critical is that it's all about quality control. Where everything that leaves this factory, it's absolutely yeah. checked in great detail. So when, it, when you walk out the door, it'll meet every specification down to. Well, and here's another aspect. How long has Bruce, the chief tech, how long has he been well, with Bruce you? Has been, my chief tech was the chief technical director for Ocean Way Studios. And, and so, He's been with me for, I think, 30 years. 30 years of know-how. So the same tech, same people. That drew me to it immediately when I was a customer. Right. It makes a huge difference. And there's today. expertise there, of course. Amazing expertise. Yeah. And think of how many rooms were you up to at one point? 19? Eight. Yeah, I made 18 rooms around the country. And, uh, you know, uh, as I say, we were just talking about I sell in the studio all the time. And to me, yeah, I was asking, when was the last time you were actually in the studio making a record? You said just a yes, day. Yeah, actually, I was there. I was in the studio yesterday, exactly. Yeah, yeah and 18 rooms, 18 configurations, 18 you know, speaker setups. Right. Bruce is involved in every single one of them, Alan designing every single one of them. Then we get to this point where we're doing. Well, the other thing, too, is you know, yeah. one of the things we often did, too, is we built studios for our clients. That was always an important part of our business. Uh, one time, Lena Ronstadt was working up at Skywalker Ranch, and they weren't happy with the speakers, so I went up there and redesigned the control room for George Lucas for Skywalker Ranch, put my whole speaker system in, and recreated that for her. Or Dave Grohl was a wonderful client, so I helped him design his studio, put the main system in there. Rob Cavallo, who is President Warner Brothers, did Green Day and all those acts, built a complete system for him. T-Bone Burnett, another one of my great clients. I did a whole system for him in Nashville. Because these guys got used to what they were hearing at Ocean Way. And they wanted that at their sure. place. And they course. wanted it home. Yeah. And sure, so, and they're the essential tools. I mean, think about yeah, all the records course. that were done. Right. And it hasn't ended. It's continued. It and seems like it's uh, as strong as ever. It can go yeah. into the home studio now. Yeah. Well, That's even it. mixers like, you know, even mixers that, uh, that are close friends for years who have a particular system that they're used to using, like when we did the system for Chris Lord Algae, who's, you know, a very successful pop mixer and not exactly easy to please. And we did a very <laughs> custom system for, for him. And he said, you know, to open windows to him. He's hearing he's never heard before. And he says, if I, had, if I had had these up there, he just thought of the things he could have done to make his mix even better. Sure. And so I think, you know, as I say, this wide variety of difficult people to please. And I think, you know, I get great pride when we do something for even someone who is maybe even a little unreasonable. And, but when they hear this, they open up and they say, my God, this is what I've been waiting for. Well, and that's really, in bringing the products to Sweetwater, I'm sure your sales engineers have all these same oh, frustrations sure with and whatnot. Every, yeah, every exactly. Kind of person. So to be able to work with Sweetwater as a partner um, and bring the whole array of speakers to Sweetwater is fantastic, especially with the knowledge of the sales engineers sure. and just the excitement the sales engineers have to participate. Anything from large integrations to the small home studio, we're really looking forward to what can happen in the future. I think it's going to be amazing. 
a collaboration for sure. Well, in all fairness, it's hard to believe, but it's one of the few places you can call and actually get an answer from someone who's technically knowledgeable and Correct. knows what they're talking about. I mean, that's, yeah, that's, 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 that's hard the to sweet water difference. That, yeah. It does make a difference. Those yeah, guys go you, through a lot of training to get to that point. And if you don't like who you're talking to, there's 450 <laughs> of them. Right. Talk to another and one. there's more every day coming yeah, in. Yeah, no, it's fantastic. It's amazing. It's, yeah. Well, also, I love it. You know, when we did our, 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 we did a couple of events there, and, you know, the after hours thing, spending time with each, they're all, because they're all, you know, they're all, they're, they're musicians, they're engineers, they're, they're all yeah, they're music from makers. the industry. Yeah. Yeah. So their appreciation of what's real. Well, indeed. I mean, think yeah. about all the great people from all over the country that came from so many different walks of studio life and sure. entertainment to work at Sweetwater. It really makes it a unique experience. That's fantastic. Plus, I like the candy. There you go. <laughs> so, you got some really cool stuff behind us here. That are, I know it's a special project. <sighs> right. Can we say, maybe check out a couple of things? Yeah, maybe no, no, give I mean, us a little bit of a download what's going on? Well, one of the things we're doing, uh, you know, as an engineer and as a producer, a lot of times if I do an album project, when it comes to the opening, if they're doing a big show at the Greek or the Hollywood Bowl, I'll come in and I'll do the live mix. Because I, for all the press is there, I need that to sound ridiculously Great. good. Yeah. So I've worked on lots of different line array systems and such. And one of my biggest issues was that as a guy who likes stereo, as a guy who likes the pan wide, right. it's tough to do in a live venue because line arrays as they exist have about, if they're good, they have 60 degrees of usable horizontal dispersion. So the problem is if you're, you know, Say you're 30, 40 rows back, and you move 10 rows to the right, you can't hear the left speaker. So if I, as a mixer, pan a guitar to the left, a third of the odds can't hear it. So basically, when you go to a show, you're hearing mono most of the time, because you just have to do that. So I said, well, if we could create a speaker along the lines of what we do here, where we get 110 degrees on the horizontal plane, I could be sitting against the wall on the right hear perfect stereo. So we created something called Supercell. And our first installation is going to be uh, in Santa Barbara, the Granada Theater. And we think it's kind of a revolution of technology because we've been stuck in this rep for 20 years. Right. And not that it's a terrible thing, but why not have stereo? Sure. And, yeah. and some of the pieces will literally leave here at uh, the end of this week, next week, yes. and are going up to the theater. So you have a chance to look at some of the custom work that's sitting behind us. And well, because I, I just, you know, I just, same thing. I, I, I love to go to a show <laughs> and not be harsh and sound, you know, I cause a thing I'll call fun loud where it's big and it's wide, but it doesn't hurt your ears. Right. There's nothing worse than nasty high end and not. So once again, it's having linear performance over the widest possible range. And also, you know, you need unlimited dynamic range and we can hit 121 dB continuous at 100 feet. So level's not an issue. Right. Right, you know, because it needs to be the same thing. When you use the straight horn design, you have unlimited efficiency. And the other thing that's incredibly important, and we talked about it in the room in there, is that, um, Having directivity and control, particularly in a live venue, if you have low frequency information hitting the sidewalls and bouncing off, say down to 100 hertz, because in most systems you have, the liners are base managed at around 85 hertz to the subs, but information above that is going all over the place. But in our system it doesn't. It actually goes out into the venue and hits the specific if it needs to. So it's not hitting the sidewalls coming back and making it muddy. It creates more definition, more resolution. And the live of the venue, the more important that is. Sure. And imagine, imagine all the folks. I mean, going to a concert these days isn't very cheap, right? No. Ticket nope. prices are going up. So if you go there and get that kind of experience, no matter where you're sitting in the hall, right? What an amazing. Well, when you're paying thing. 150 bucks a ticket and up, you're, the audience is going to get more demanding. Sure. And they're going to want better. They want to sound great. I mean, yeah, come on, you want, want a lovely experience. You want yeah. to walk in there and walk out, you know, having a great yeah, it's a exactly. great evening. So yeah. we envision this as being, as far as a step forward, it's going to ho open a whole brand new business for us. Awesome. I wish you guys the best of luck with that. Well, thank you very sure, much. I appreciate awesome. that. Yeah. All right. So here we are, kind of in the nucleus, the tech room. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to let you know we make a microphone, a pretty well-known ribbon microphone. Okay. So I think Alan has one. He's going to show it to you. They're sort, of, <laughs> they're sort of heavy, actually. You know, for me, you know, as an engineer, of course, I've been known as a microphone guy. And for me, uh, if I was going to manufacture something, I says I wanted something once again like speakers that no one ever done before. And I was, you know, I had all the RCA ribbons. I had, you know, the B&O ribbons from the '50s. I had all sorts of ribbons. You well, know. you've had famous mics that are yeah, I mean, well I, I, known. I, I, you know, sure the collection I, at Oceanway's got to be. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we had a thousand microphones. You know? right. It's like so we had a lot of microphones, right. but. Um, 
uh, Cliff Henriksen, once again, who's an original physicist, came up with this idea of building a ribbon mic because there's things we like about ribbon mics in that they don't exaggerate sibilance. So in certain aspects of them are fairly natural. But the other problem is that most ribbon designs that are out there are all from the 50s. Yeah. It's 50s and 40s designs that have been updated. I said, so let's see if we can do a revolution here. So Cliff came up with a microphone that basically, the first thing we had to do was triple the magnetic force because the bigger the magnet structure, the more powerful the gauss is the gap, the more resolution, the more definition of the microphone. Also, way more output. So no one had ever done this before. We actually got 12,000 gauss, which is a magnetic, in the gap. And it's a wide gap, and that had never been done before. So it's, it's almost two and a half times what any other microphone has. So that was a feat in and of itself. It is neomedium magnets, and this thing weighs a ton. But the other thing was that there's a question when you're talking about the wavelengths at higher frequencies are very short. And any reflections that happen in here create anomalies. And so a lot of ribbon microphones have a sort of a quirkiness. You know, mm -hmm. it's sure. not like you put up a U47, well, that's that. And you put up a, a ribbon mic, well, it's different. But, you know, in, in all aspects, it's not as natural sounding. Even though, say, the 47 has more accentuated top. So we said, well, can we get both? So we came up with something where the physics of the pole piece does nothing to affect the response at all. It's perfect. It's, an, it's like almost creating open air. So when you talk in this microphone, it's like talking into a Tele 251. I mean, it's a great vocal mic. It doesn't sound, it, it has aspects of a microphone, but it sounds more like a bigger than life, huge condenser microphone. So it bridges the gap. And um, I think it's probably one of the most natural sounding mics I've ever heard. Uh, and you know, like a pair of these on acoustic guitar or a pair of these on a piano. Well, how about one on a guitar cabinet? Well, my friend, like my buddy, my buddy Steve Vai, when he put these on his amps, he yeah. said, this is just crazy. I remember I ran this, my buddy Turo, Turo Sandoval, we had a, another ribbon microphone, I won't name it, we had this, which he'd used for a while. We set this next to it. He listens to it in the headphones and goes, oh my God, that's... How far back did you put it? Well, with him, you know, say three and a half feet. Okay, with a pop filter? Well, it, no, it doesn't need a pop filter. No, that's fine okay. for, for a trumpet. The only thing you have to know, because uh, ribbon mics are figure eight, you know, what I did is I just set up a moving blanket, you know, say four or five feet back behind it to prevent the reflection of the sidewall coming back to the back. How about when Steve I use it on the guitar cabinet? What well, you know, do? push it where you put a 57. Okay. You know, but because it has all Straight this... Straight up right on it? Well, you know, or just... You, you jump just it down a little bit. Slightly off axis to the dome. Okay. And depending upon how loud it is, I might put a windscreen in front. To, if there's a uh -huh. lot of air pressure, I would put a windscreen in front to prevent the air pressure from damaging it. But it'll take levels, not a problem, as right. long as you, it's, it's the wind that's a problem. Okay. Sure. That you keep the air pressure down. But we think we've created something. There's a, a couple of scarring mixers who have put these up against M50s on, as wides and been almost in shock. Right. That so they, they on can orchestras, sound, they, they can have... sound that big yeah. and that wide. So it's sort of, we think it's kind of a revolution in technology in the same way that our speakers are. Fantastic. And so this is the RM1B ribbon microphone. Yeah. yeah. Killer. Try one. Thank you, guys. Today. Yeah, man. Today. <laughs> today. Yeah, right. <laughs> Go shopping. Fellas, thank you so much. That was a really fun tour. The stories, the technical side of the speakers and, and everything you guys do. Kind of hate to see you go. I know, it was awesome. <laughs> I think the relationship between Ocean Way Audio and Sweetwater is gonna be long and fruitful for sure. This, this incredible gear here, I love it. Thank you so much for having us here and uh, taking the time. Well, thank well, you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, come, Great having we you. We appreciate it. And please come back to Sweetwater soon. Okay, All right. Cheers. Thanks. Thank you everybody, bye.